Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're watching us from. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to the AgriForce report launch of the Navigating the Food Crisis Perspectives from Africa and Southeast Asia. My name is Nyendo Mashua. I work as a communications officer at the Stockholm Environment Institute, and I lead the communications and engagement team for the AgriForce 2030 program. Together with my colleague Eva, who you'll soon meet, will be your moderators for today's event. With only seven years left to achieving the, Uni the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, food insecurity remains a significant global challenge, catalyzed by climate change, population growth, and the COVID-19 pandemic. The AgriForce 2030 report that we'll be launching today is a crucial contribution to our understanding of the challenges and opportunities of navigating the food crisis, specifically from the perspectives of Africa and Southeast Asia. We are honored to have a distinguished panel of experts who are project leaders from the AgriForce project and members of our advisory board who will share their insights and recommendations. We look forward to hearing from them about the report's key findings and how they can inform policies and practices for sustainable and resilient food systems in these regions. You can find the report on our website, slu.se forward slash agriforce. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here. And without much further ado, I'd like to introduce Sophia Bockfist, the Agriforce 2030 Program Director. Thank you, Nijendo. Thank you, everyone joining here and also everyone that is joining online. So my name is Sofia Bokvist and I'm the director of the AgriForce program. And uh, apart from that, I'm also a researcher at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. Uh, and this morning I traveled by train from Uppsala to come here and I did a bit of thinking of, of, of this re report and what was a starting spark for this, why we did this report. And if I remember correctly, it was Madeleine Ostwald, who is one of the team members of the AgriFusi 2030 program. And she said at one of our regular meetings, something like this, she said like, you know, guys, we should, we should reach out to the project teams in Asia and Africa and ask them how their projects tackle this global food crisis, what challenges they have and what they do to solve that and contribute to food security. And then we spent some time talking about that. We talked about the draft in Eastern Africa, floodings. We talked about effects of the Russian war on Ukraine and how that has led to increased prices of fuel and food and transportations. And we also talked about disrupted markets as a result of restrictions due to the COVID pandemic. Then the ball was rolling, definitely. And we reached out to the 18 project teams we have in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South and Southeast Asia and ask them for the reflections on these matters. So in this report that we're launching today, we have compiled seven AgriForce 2030 program voices from the field, from Kenya, from Uganda, from Vietnam, Cambodia and the Philippines. And we will invite you to tour to Africa and to Asia. Uh, where some of the project teams will give their perspectives on how their projects contribute to solve the challenges related to the current food crisis. And as Nijendo just mentioned, this is highly relevant as we're only seven years away from 2030, but the distance to reach the sustainable development goals are get, getting even bigger for every year. And how can this be tackled at local level where the food is produced? So the AgriForce program has, since its start in 2016, filled an important gap in building and supporting capacity for individual researchers and their research institutes in Sub-Saharan Africa and East and Southeast Asia to synthesize, analyze, communicate, and also to co-create knowledge in support of productive and sustainable small-scale farming. And at the AgriFusC program, we, we do not use that trickle-down approach, more like the trickle-up approach, so to say. And we have developed an innovative approach to translate science to improve local practices and policies. And more practically, this means close collaborations between research institutes, universities, scientists, 
stakeholders, politicians, policymakers, and farmers, for them to come together and co-create locally adapted knowledge that will improve policy and practice in target regions. And today you will hear these seven contributions uh, included in this report. Uh, and they all describe specific examples related to food security in time of crisis. However, you can also look at it from the other perspective. These are seven projects showing the way forward. And I'm very, very proud of this report that has been produced and is being launched today. And uh, I'm very happy to listen to the contribution. And now I will invite Gunnar Schelin, who will give some opening remarks. And Gunnar is one of the members in the agri 4 c 2030 advisory board. The screen is yours, Gunnar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sophia. I'm, I'm really very honored to give these uh, few opening remarks at the launch of this very important perspectives uh, report. So in my mind, and I'm sure in yours too, it's always relevant to meet and talk about research in agriculture for food security, but this particular launch is, is very, very timely because of what is happening around us in, in the world uh, today. As I'm sure you've all seen in the media, the World Bank and IMF have their spring meetings right now, and, and some of the key messages coming out of that meeting is that food inflation is still high, not only here in Sweden, but maybe in your countries, but actually globally. And extreme poverty is increasing again, which is, of course, very worrying after, you know, decades of other improvements. And as uh, Sophia has already said, the underlying causes are, are apparent to all. We have the Russian war on, on Ukraine has affected the availability and price of food, particularly wheat, which has a direct effect on not least in, in East Africa that has been affected by, by uh, droughts. Then you have, the, of course, that Russia and Ukraine are among the leading exporters of, of uh, fertilizers, which further aggravates the cost of agricultural production and has a cascading effect on the volumes of agricultural products and prices uh, globally. And as was mentioned, all of this, of course, came down on the back of the COVID crisis that had already given a devastating blow to many economies in the global south with increasing poverty as a result. And then we have at the background looming the devastating effects of climate change. Uh, and we already start to see uh, the implications of, of that. So given this accumulation of crises that directly affect food security globally, particularly in the most vulnerable countries, we should all be thankful that there are dedicated researchers like we see here today, who focus exactly on food security in these vulnerable countries. And we see many brilliant examples here in the re report, and, and we will hear more uh, from them after me. So the focus of agri 2030 and, and the work presented here today is on the enhancement of resilient smallholder farming systems. And it's of course not a coincidence that, that we are working on this. To us here at this meeting, it might seem so obvious to invest in and strengthen smallholder farming systems, uh, but it's actually true also if we take a step back and look at alternative development strategies, that we should look at this. More than a decade ago, when we worked on the World Development Report 2008 on agriculture for development, it was documented already then that investments in agriculture is not only the best poverty reduction approach, it's also the best development approach. And we still see that growth in the agricultural sector is two to four times more effective in raising incomes among the poorest compared to investments in, in other sectors. So given what we know about the importance of agriculture for food security, poverty reduction and development, one would think that all countries, particularly developing countries, would invest a lot in applied research on agriculture. But as I'm sure that we have all experienced here, far from enough is actually done in, in this respect. And the current fiscal crisis in many poor countries after the COVID makes it even harder. And at the same time, there are many other sectors that are competing for attention. I know, for example, that the African Development Bank has prioritized funding for just energy transition for Africa rather than uh, agriculture. So it is in this context that AgriFocus 2030 and its research collaborations uh, are so important. 
So as I have uh, repeatedly voiced in the advisory board, agriculture is this unique combination of being very targeted and very broad. <laughs> so let me explain my, my contradiction here. So agriculture is of course targeted in its singular focus on applying science to SDG2. Uh, to end hunger, achieve food security, improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. But agriculture is very eclectic in how it does this. As we will see here today, agriculture has its four challenges and marries multiple disciplines while it zooms in on this important science policy interface. And agriculture does this in, in many, many countries and with very many uh, institutions and researchers. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure that that uh, you'll be as impressed as I am in, in you know, Agrifos actually pulling this off. So I would like to to finish by congratulating all the contributors to this uh, report and for work uh, well done. And I would end by wishing that this second funding cycle from CEDA will be followed by a third. And we will, we are many here in the audience that will be very curious of the closing remarks that will be provided by Matsoba at the end of this session. So thank you. And back to you, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you, Gunnar, for those succinct remarks and no pressure on Mats, who is here representing CEDA. Um, thank you for that. Um, I think we move straight, straight into our first panel, which will be com comprised of project leaders from our Africa projects, select Africa projects. We have Frank from Uganda, Judith also from Uganda, also joined by Janaina from Uganda. And we have David from Kenya, Samuel from Kenya, and we're joined by our AgriForce board, advisory board member from Kenya, Steve, Stephen. We can start with Frank, who can give us a summary of his uh, submission for the report. Frank, over to you. Frank? Yes, uh, thank you very much and uh, good morning to everyone. Good evening to wherever you are. Yes, uh, Frank Mugaga from Ake University and the project leader for the RAFS project, which is the Resilient Urban Food Systems project that we are implementing in two cities in Bali and Kasese. Uh, the motivation for this uh, project was uh, the fact that uh, despite the overwhelming evidence which points towards the contribution of smallholder farmers to urban food sheds in these cities, uh, smallholder farmers have often been left out of uh, policy and decision-making processes which affect their operational environment. Yet, these farmers are facing a multitude of climate-induced challenges such as droughts, floods, and uh, all these hamper their steady food production. And more recently, uh, smallholder farmers were affected by COVID-19 because of the restrictions that were imposed by government which uh, uh, impacted on their social interaction, transport, and mobility. In terms of uh, what we think that has to be done to avert these challenges, one, we think that uh, uh, protracted action by way of mobilizing and organizing farmers into viable groups is critical to their uh, voice being uh, uh, represented and participating in these uh, decision-making processes. Two, we also think that uh, uh, respective urban authorities need to create databases on farmer groups that operate within their boundaries such that they can use these uh, databases to include them in local budgeting processes. And, th and thirdly, we also think that there is need for the farmers to build synergies, maintain communication and integrate actions between different uh, stakeholders, both from the state and non-state actors, such that they can build the resilience to climate vulnerabilities such as floods and uh, droughts. Uh, what have we done as RAFs in Uganda? Uh, we've done three things. Largely, we've mobilized smallholder farmers into formal groups and platforms, which can be supported by the, their respective local governments with the technical and financial uh, resources. Two, we've also conducted the resilience building trainings uh, through which the farmers that we've mobilized have been provided with the relevant knowledge to guide their planning for farming activities. And thirdly, We've also uh, uh, facilitated peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchanges across the two areas where we are operating, especially uh, the smallholder farmers have uh, been exposed to new ideas 
which have enabled them to expand their networks and have also been able to share uh, learning experiences which are geared towards transforming their uh, urban local food systems. Uh, in terms of uh, what we are seeing that uh, we've contributed in terms of the changes among our stakeholders, one, the decision makers, including politicians and technical personnel in the two areas we are operating, have started to appreciate smallholder farmers as key players in the urban food shed. For example, in Kasese uh, municipality, which is one of our sites, representatives of smallholder farmers uh, were for the first time invited and involved in the budgeting processes for the 2022-2023 planning year. In Imbali City, a new position of horticultural officer has been created to offer targeted technical support to horticultural farmers. All these were not there before the project started. Two, on the smallholder farmers themselves, we've seen to uh, we've uh, seen them continue to mobilize themselves into formal groups aimed at tapping into existing opportunities. For example, currently the government of Uganda is uh, implementing the parish development model, and through these groups, uh, the, uh, the farmers have started benefiting. And we are proud to have contributed towards unlocking their potential, and hence the title of the project, Unlocking the Potential of Smallholder Farmers uh, in Imbali City and uh, Kasese Municipality towards a more resilient urban food system. I submit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank. Moving over to Judith to give us a summary of the submission in the report. Judith, over to you. Thank you, thank you, very, thank you very much, Ngendo. Uh, Judith Nagasha from Uganda, Chambogo University, under challenge one. Uh, I'm looking at um, gender-based approaches for improved milk safety, value addition, and marketing systems in uh, smallholder farmers in the western part of the country. And uh, the challenge is that uh, we were on ground uh, while food was coming in. There was uh, plenty of milk being wasted because of low prices during the low uh, uh, wage seasons. There were also uh, low household incomes in the community and also less empowerment of women because with value addition in this culture, it is only the women who do value addition because of the culture and because the community is highly patriarchal. So men have a big say in the, the sole decision makers in this community. Um, how, what, what we have done as Uncle Fossi and uh, this project, we are building capacity of women add value so that we can increase uh, incomes in their households. And we have, we are training, uh, women to do value addition, but the entry point was a bit uh, tricky, but I think now we are there because we have built trust. And the, all, the first step that was taken was to involve the male counterparts. You cannot access any woman in this community without consent from the house, the, the, the spouse, and they're the, um, the owners of milk, assets, cattle, mission, all. So in order for us to have an entry point, we have to, we have to bring them on board so that we may build capacity. And uh, what the project has done so far for us, we used uh, um, an entry point using a theory of change that was we were trained by a Bufose team. I think it was one of those approaches that have, have helped the, the project penetrate this community. And we have involved different stakeholders, uh, the male counterparts being the very key essential stakeholders in this community. So they run all through the project, whatever we are going to do in this community, we have to have consent of all the men. And what we have seen, we have seen positive change. That now the, 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 the male counterparts have opened up because they the built trust with the project leaders and the implementing team. And also this has, you know, they have, they are also freely, now the, the women can access milk after buying it from the men because we said, yes, they, you want money, but there's more money when you add value to this milk in terms of yogurt and cosmetics, different products of cosmetics, body lotions, jellies, uh, oils, all those are being done within this community and they have trained, to, now they are embracing it. And the change that has, uh, that has, that has, has also, shook me is that this community from where my university is is about 340 kilometers from the town and yet we wanted to advance their training with a with a, a very big institute here in, in Kampala 
which is Uganda Research Industry Institute that had different technologies and advancement in terms of value addition. And my problem, a problem was getting these women on board. So we visited the communities, talked to the fellow count, the men, uh, their husbands, and they consented. These women traveled alone without their husbands to the, to the city for training. That was to me was really a big, big change. And I think was this is attributed to the theory of change. And they have also accepted because we said for sustainable marketing, you need to work in groups. And because the, the distances from one household to, to another is that, that is quite big. So they have also agreed to work in groups. We are training them in groups, supporting them in groups, and we are seeing empowerment you know, starting to mushroom out of this when they are now they're outspoken now they can speak up and i think this is very positive for agroforce and for us as a, a country and way forward i think i must attribute this to agroforce for mainstreaming gender inclusivity in all their programs and uh, this goes beyond agroforce it always also mainstream gender in agricultural research and also productivity thank you very much thank you judith very good changes that you're experiencing there in Uganda. Now we move over to Janaina. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Janina Karungi from Makere University. I'm an associate professor of crop science. So I lead a team that is working on a challenge to agroforestry project on sustainable intensification in the coffee banana system of the Mount Elgon region of Uganda. So the motivation for this work came out of the situation in Uganda where you find that our population growth is one among the highest on the continent with a 3% rate per year. Uh, so now we are 47 plus million people and counting and Uganda is not a big country. So this population puts a lot of pressure on land resources for food and for feed and economic development. Yet the trends are showing that since actually 2014, the productivity and production of key food security crops like banana, millet, maize, beans, groundnuts, even cash crops like coffee has been actually fluctuating hugely. And you find that in a given year when we have shocks like drought, uh, some regions go into food crisis, others are food stressed, whereas you find like 60% are the ones that are not affected. So above 30% are more or less in a crisis. So this is due to the weather, as I've said, usually drought. So when we have a drought event, you expect that we will have a crisis. Then the other challenge has been the low productivity levels from farms. So in Uganda, most of our agriculture is done by small scale holders and the productivity coming from those farms is very low. And this was even before we had shocks like COVID, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war, Ebola here in Uganda, and the continuing climate change situation. Like this season, we are, ex we are expecting rain, but it rains once like in two weeks. So you find that we have issues of food security, nutrition security, and the inflation in food prices. At one point at, in 2022, it was at, at 20, over 20% 20 inflation in food prices. So what we need to do is uh, to see how to increase production on the small pieces of land that our farmers have in a sustainable way. And that's when we brought in this project, this agri project, uh, that how can we empower our farmers to change their mindset so that they can increase productivity on the small pieces of, of land that they do have. So we decided that we need to bring together all the stakeholders, the farmers, the extension, the researchers, the private sector made up of middlemen exporters, like in the case of coffee, the policymakers, all of them to come together and talk together in dialogues and see how to transform the agriculture sector. So we, we wanted to have entry points into, in, in creating this dialogue. And there are government programs that are currently running, like the Parish Development Model, 
So it was one of the things we wanted to talk about in those dialogues. How can we as researchers help the farmers uh, through the parish development model? Then also in these platforms, we want uh, farmers to be empowered and have a voice eh, so that they can demand for fair prices for their produce. Because if you have a cash crop and you get good income from it, then you are food secure in your home. So uh, the project was set up in the Mount Elgon region, which is one of the areas with very high population growth. But they have an opportunity in that they, they have banana and coffee as key crops. And banana is a food security crop, whereas coffee is an economic security crop. So these were our entry points. We want to see how they can increase productivity, that is intensification in this banana coffee system. The intensification can be conventional or it can be agroecological, depending on the reality on the ground. So what we have been able to do is to bring these people together on a platform to start the dialogue. And uh, we were very happy to find that everybody that we invited to start this dialogue process came. They even invited people we had not even invited that let's go. So we were happy to have them. And we sat together and went through together, through the theory of change together, so that we co-create and uh, drive transformation as a group of all the stakeholders. So we have already done that. And in that co-creation, in that co-planning, uh, the local people, including the farmers and the area uh, leaders, eh, were the ones that actually suggested to us who should be trained to move forward, because we want to, to use model farmers as our platform for change. Eh? And uh, they are the ones that help us select these model farmers who are actually now being trained and empowered. And then these model farmers will now do the, the, the co training of their counterparts. So we, ha we are happy so far with the progress. Uh, so our mandate is to create the platforms where we can bring every stakeholder. And we actually did stakeholder analysis in that workshop that we had, the two big workshops we had, and they all identified who are the stakeholders that need to come together. So our mandate is to create that platform, bring everybody together, give farmers a voice, and also build capacity. Because sometimes you find they have gaps in knowledge as far as crop production is concerned, and that's where us as the educators and, and researchers come in. So we are happy that AgriForce has uh, funded this project and we are seeing good uh, results coming out already, even though it's six months into the project. Thank you, Mendo. Thank you very much, Janaina. You can read more about all these projects on our website, slu.se forward slash AgriForce. Now we move over to my home country, Kenya, and we hear from David Chakinda. David, you need to unmute yourself. We are still in the era of unmuting and muting. So I understand the technical challenges. Over to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ngendo. And uh, I want to welcome everybody to this uh, launch. Now, uh, I'm David Jakinda, a senior lecturer of agricultural economics at the University of Nairobi, Kenya. And uh, the project that we are implementing, uh, courtesy of AgriForce, focuses on transformation of pastoralist livelihoods uh, through enhanced uh, adaptation of nutrition and commercialization policies to the local context in West Pokot County, which is a dry land area. And uh, the issue we are addressing uh, is that uh, that part of the country experiences prolonged droughts. And when uh, that happens, uh, the smallholder uh, livestock keepers lose up to 30% of their uh, livestock herds. And in terms of the policy response, uh, what has been happening is that uh, the national and even local county government, uh, first of all, delays to put in place any uh, response mechanism. But then when they do that, uh, they focus on uh, imports of cereals, particularly maize, 
Uh, yet we know that uh, maize alone is not uh, uh, is not adequate nutritionally. So that's one challenge. The other challenge is that even when the emergency uh, response through relief maize is put in place, uh, it, it is uh, done as a top-down approach without consultation of the very uh, local households whose food or nutrition security those initiatives are meant to address. So what we see from the project point of view that needs to be done to achieve sustainable food and nutrition security for the affected household, uh, we see three intervention areas. One is that we think it's necessary to develop a mechanism of incorporating the local households uh, views. First of all, in the definition of what food and nutritional security is. And number two, in the planning of the best uh, response mechanism. So their voices need to be incorporated in the design or the planning of the interventions. Number two, we see that it's necessary to incorporate uh, indigenous knowledge, particularly on the foods that uh, are needed in the area based on the local people's food preferences. So this need to incorporate uh, their dietary preferences as well as their knowledge on how to prepare uh, those foods. Number three is that uh, we see the need to build capacity of the local households uh, in terms of value addition for the various foods and uh, understanding and even complying with uh, different requirements, standards and regulation in the food marketing. So those are three important interventions that uh, will be very, very instrumental in achieving sustainable food and nutrition security. Now, this AgriForce project uh, that we are implementing has focused on three intervention areas in order to address the situation. One is that uh, we've been able, through this project, to create mechanisms that allow dialogue uh, between the local county planners and uh, members of the local community so that they are able to uh present their views on what they think is the best nutrition intervention so creating an opportunity for dialogue between the local government officials and uh, the smallholder pastoralists and farmers number two is that this project has been able to facilitate learning uh, on indigenous food preparation and utilization particularly uh, by working with local women groups to train other members of the community on how to develop how to how to prepare indigenous foods which are drawn from uh, different indigenous crops as well as uh, livestock products like meat because it, it's very important to to document that knowledge for future generation because a lot of the indigenous foods have been forgotten by the, the youth and uh, that, that gap needs to be addressed. So that's one of the interventions that this project uh, is working on. Number three is that this project uh, has done some work in facilitating peer learning uh, of the local pastoralists and farmers uh, by supporting them to visit other farmers in other parts of the country to learn on, and share knowledge on certain foods which can actually be grown uh, in the drylands because they, they've uh, thrived in other areas with similar challenges and how to add value on those foods. So uh, having done that, we are beginning to see uh, some small changes uh, which are useful and we attribute them to the initiatives that we've undertaken. One of them is that uh, following from the peer learning or exchange learning visits of, the, of these pastoralists to other parts of the country, uh, we are able to see that their own local county government 
that previously uh, could not find resources or plan for uh, group training on value addition has stepped up and uh, integrated uh, training and they've actually trained close to 100 farmers whereas in our case we are only able to support about 30 to 40. so they've sort of bought that idea and in their own way they've been able to reorganize their budgeting and found some resources to do their own training of their staff as well as members of the community number two is that uh, through this initiative of supporting women groups to train others on on how to prepare indigenous foods how to preserve them and utilize them uh, the county government has been able to use the women group as a i call it champions because now uh, after our training they've been able to be invited to train other people so the county government which previously uh, could not give them a voice has now seen that what they are doing makes sense and has incorporated them as uh, champions of nutrition in the community so we believe that going forward uh, there will be more positive changes which then uh, fit well with our theme of transformation of the nutrition and commercialization aspects uh, by uh, making sure that they are uh, they fit the local context so thank you very much thank you very much david now our last um, project leader is samuel who will be followed by stephen mushiri our advisory board member over to you samuel Thank you, thank you Nganda. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I'm Samuel Omondi, uh, leading a project on uh, governance of food systems in Nakuru and Kisumu counties of Kenya. I'm working within a research team consisting of researchers from the University of Nairobi and a local NGO called Bazingira Institute and of course we work closely with the two county governments so a few points about the local challenges and the context first of all climate change is a big issue and the resultant uh, variable weather patterns such as prolonged droughts uh, delayed rains uh, the rains coming but very short uh, risks such as pest and diseases are really uh, are tampered with the way our smallholders farmers are producing their crops. And the situation has been worsened by uh, over dependence on rain fed agriculture. The second issue is that uh, for us, food security implies maize to some extent, wheat and rice. and these are commodities that are highly disrupted by uh, whenever shocks happen within the supply chain. For instance, uh, the COVID-19 outbreak, the wars that are happening, you know, and the international, the fluctuation of uh, prices at the international markets really affect these crops. So what needs to be done? Um, in our project, we think it's about time now we start tapping into productivity of potential of traditional crops and broadening uh, the food basket, not relying mainly on maize, wheat, and rice as our main staples, but instead diversify. And we can do this by um, encouraging our farmers uh, to cultivate uh, shock resistant crops. These are the traditional crops, traditional and indigenous to our surroundings, they are better equipped uh, to resist uh, the effects of climate change and, uh, and droughts, and also resistant to uh, pests and diseases. So what has the project done so far? Uh, on the governance of food system, uh, we've tried to establish platforms uh, for discussing food system issues with a focus on traditional vegetables. And in these platforms, we bring together stakeholders that are being affected, ranging from smallholder farmers, traders, 
uh, the county governments, consumers, and any other stakeholder who is affected within that particular value chain. And then we've also engaged in capacity building through peer learning activities. We've had sessions where our farmers uh, learn from fellow farmers and also sessions where counties learn from each other. I'll give an example of that. Uh, Nairobi has got a food system strategy and the two counties are in the process of developing one. So we had the chance of inviting uh, county staff from Nairobi uh, to discuss with their colleagues in Kisumu and Nakuru on how they can come up with these food system strategies. Another uh, area we are keen on is to champion for inclusive food system governance and uh, institutionalization of food systems. And uh, through our, our activities, and of course, activities of other actors, we've seen that Kisumuna is in the process of developing a food system strategy. So what are some of the significant changes that we've observed from our activities? Uh, first of all, is that uh, our small group of smallholder farmers, it appears to us like they're gaining a voice to demand for better services, for better quality, for among consumers demanding better quality goods. I mean, in terms of food system governance, we are seeing an improvement in that particular area. Again, there's a change in mind, mindset and approach, especially from our county governments. Now, the two county governments, I think, are in agreement that it is very important to involve farmers when they are making decisions that affect the smallholder farmers. Another uh, significant change, which of course I cannot solely attribute to our efforts, is that uh, Kisumu County is currently working on a food system strategy. And that's one of the key changes that uh, we had envisioned in our theory of change. Of course, the main funder here is someone else, but I believe we've also uh, them to pursue that particular direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samuel. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from Stephen Moshiri, who is one of the AgriForce uh, advisory board members based in Kenya. Thank you, Ngendo. I think I had about five questions is it, to respond to. Um, one was around uh, an overview of the food crisis in the region I am in. And I think just like everybody has said, uh, the advent of uh, COVID in East Africa greatly affected uh, and greatly impacted production in the region. And uh, a series of shocks thereafter have actually led to significant food insecurity. Uh, like was mentioned, COVID caused a limitation in movement within uh, countries and across borders. And we saw what you call food nationalism. The drought that crept uh, in the entire region also resulted in massive crop failure. We have lost a lot of livestock and drought has seen uh, the rise of desert locusts, army fallworms, uh, and these, all these have actually strained uh, us in terms of resources to manage them. Of course, the war has also strained access to fertilizer, and the demand and supply forces have actually made fertilizer very expensive to procure. In Kenya, the strengthening of the dollar has created, because of market uncertainties, has also created a new uh, challenge. No, you can hear me. Uh, and uh, the new challenge is on cost of importation. Bear in mind that uh, the entire region right now doesn't have sufficient or surplus food, so we're actually importing. So importing food is actually very expensive, energy is very expensive, and that component by the shock that I've talked about have led to closure of many SMEs, MSMEs, and those of employment as a result of the rising cost of living. So the region is currently uh, facing a challenge of maize, and uh, for example, Kenya, where, which actually buys from Zambia, now Zambia even has no maize. It has actually stopped uh, exports. It's actually also importing. Uh, we also have insufficient raw material for animal feed, resulting in very high costs of production, as well as uh, I think whatever else has talked about uh, falling in productivity. 
Uh, the second question I was supposed to respond to uh, was to do with the importance of supporting and enhancing resilient smallholder uh, systems uh, in terms of achieving SDGs. I think we all know that farmers are the backbone of any food system. <laughs> and smallholder farmers collectively feed more than 65% of the entire population of Africa as well as Asia. So they actually code the sustainability of any value chain. However, majority are in what you call low value value chains. Therefore, they actually take home what you call the least value in any value chain. This, so the recent series of shocks have exposed us in terms of how vulnerable our food systems can actually be, and more so the farmers who are actually the backbone of our food systems. So what do we need to do? It is important that we create incentives for farmers, practicing resilient forms of farming. Uh, I, when I look through the report, I could see that uh, uh, there's work around agroecology. I think these kind of uh, practices should be supported, but more importantly, incentivized, because at the moment, we don't have any incentives around agroecology, because um, agroecology and others actually transcend some of the shocks that uh, have actually been mentioned. Number two, it's important that we support the adaptation agenda. The climate adaptation agenda is actually very important. Uh, because the challenge you're having now in adaptation is that we don't have sufficient investments in that, and we actually need to look at how we can channel more investments around that so that we can actually scale up adaptation practices. Number three, it's important that we develop and implement what you call import substitution strategies. Like you've had, we're now importing almost everything, but you don't have policies that actually help us manage, manage that. And it's important that we also try and diversify our food chain, and I think that has been alluded to. Number four, it's important that we support the food system partnerships. And I think one of the presenters talked about it, uh, especially in terms of proper governance, but most importantly, the balance of power. My third question was the issue of was on the need for science-based knowledge uh, and translating science to improve practice and policy, the value add by agri -forcet. I think it's very clear that we cannot run away from science. I think the challenge we have in Africa uh, and probably other regions, is that uh, scientists still want to talk a lot to other scientists. And they don't want to talk to policymakers, uh, they don't want to talk a lot to private sector, and even engage farmers. And I think this has been mentioned in so many reports as one of the reasons why there's, there's a low uptake of innovations. Um, there's actually a need to co-create knowledge. I think we need to see how these partnerships can be uh, built better, so that we actually blend practice and research. These relationships need to be created, like I said, they need to be mutual, but most important, they also need to be balanced. From my observation, policy work has been left to politicians, and because they lack scientific evidence to inform policy, uh, and because those scientists have shied away from these discussions, the end result is that most of the policies that we have in our region have failed to attract uh, what we call the right uh, investments. And the last question was on reflection on uh, AgriForce's work. I think, uh, like I mentioned, I went through the report, and uh, when I looked, especially at the report from Africa, I observed that, uh, uh, and that has actually been mentioned by the speakers earlier, that uh, that many of the pillars that that would support mitigation of food crisis are actually being worked around. If I could mention a few, for example, I read reports on agroecology, value addition, irrigation diversification of diets, formation of organized groups into cooperatives, gender-related interventions, building partnership ecosystems, working on communication, which is actually very important, and I think that has been alluded to by most of the speakers. I think in terms of the next steps, which I feel are always a challenge, is the issue of scaling. You know, how do we actually scale to create impact? I think someone talked about working with very few farmers uh, as compared to, you know, working with large numbers. Uh, number two is the issue of complementarity or integration into bigger programs and partnerships. And I've liked the presentation around exchange visits between counties, which I think uh, actually helps in terms of cross-learning. The issue of communication, I think this is very important. Scientists don't usually communicate results to policymakers. Well, scientists do not communicate results to investors. I think it's important that we tweak this around how that can actually be improved. And I think someone has talked about this at the beginning, additional resources. I think resources are usually never enough. We need to think about how to continuously uh, uh, mobilize resources. And the last one was on other relevant reflections. I think, uh, in my view, um, there are many challenges that lie ahead, and they're actually going to be quite significant. 
And uh, when you look at, for example, the geopolitical happenings now, I think there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. Uh, you can see uh, the BRICS and, and so on. You don't, we don't know what's going to actually happen going forward. The dollar is, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty around that. Uh, issues of nationalism, I think that's something that we have, we have, we have seen with COVID, food nationalism. Uh, the second thing is, of course, the magnitude of the impacts of climate change. Uh, in East Africa, uh, this has moved from a five-year cycle to a three-year cycle. Now it's almost every year. And we are seeing a lot of conflicts. But also important, we are seeing a lot of losses. I just came from Malawi, and uh, the, 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 the cyclone there was actually very devastating and affected, you know, majority of farmers. Um, the lowering productivity, I think we all know we have a challenge of production and productivity. Soils are becoming poor, the weather is becoming erratic. And the last one, but not least, is our growing population, which means that the demand for food and feed is actually going to be unsurmountable. So I think these are challenges uh, that I feel are going to be ahead of us. They're already here and they are, they are going to actually increase. So as a project, we actually need to also think about this in terms of how we actually going to intervene. Otherwise, thank you very much for listening to me. Appreciate it. And I submit. Thank you, Stephen. And for all the Africa panelists and all their submissions, remember you can read the report, the full report on the website, um, slu.se forward slash agriforce, where you can learn about the projects and what they're doing on ground to overcome the challenges that smallholder farmers are encountering. Now I hand over to my colleague, Ivar, who will take over for the Asia panel. Welcome, Ivar. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Njandu. I'm Ivar, I'm a colleague of Njandu Heritage AI, but also a very proud member of the Agriforce Consortium. And, I, and especially, I'm even more proud now, I think uh, we heard some fantastic presentations from Africa, perspectives on, on, on the crisis, but also a lot of useful insights on how to attack or how to address those um, challenges. And I think thank you to the whole African team for, for those insights and for, for making a change, I think, towards what we think is a better future. Uh, so from Africa, we're doing a giant leap over the Indian Ocean into South uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, where um, uh, Agriforce has a number of projects. And we will hear from two projects. Um, and we will also hear, so we'll hear from um, Florida Lees uh, in, in Philippines. We'll hear from, hear from her colleague Sen in Vietnam and from Fanit in Cambodia. Uh, we will also hear from um, Rahmat in Vietnam. Uh, we will also hear, have our Agriforce board members, Siam from Vietnam and Iris from Philippines. Those are the panel members of the, of the South South East Asian uh, panel. Uh, so we will hear about uh, um, uh, digitalization of, of extension. We'll hear about uh, uh, e-commerce. And, but I'll give the floor now to you, Floor de Lis. Uh, the, the floor is yours, um, <clears throat> please. Okay. So thank you, Sir Ivar. Um, good day to everyone out there and good afternoon from the Philippines. I'm Flor de Lis B. Dacuyan, the project leader of AgriFOSI 2030 Digitalization of Extension Services in Southeast Asia, Philippines, and working hand in hand with Dr. Lethe Hua Sen of Wei University of Agricultural Sciences in Vietnam and Dr. Cho Fanet of Royal University of Phnom Phen, Cambodia. So um, with our project, Digitalization of Extension Services, we have recognized that while Southeast Asia region began to recover from the COVID-19 crisis, a new challenge emerged with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And it is causing significant shocks to the food supply chain in the region with the rising costs of energy, fertilizers, wheat, and wheat-related products. The war has highlighted the disparities, inequalities, and vulnerabilities in global food production with major grain importing countries such as the Philippines at risk of food price shocks and potential food insecurity. What needs to be done? Farmers must be connected to domestic and international market actors and facilitate access to supplies, techniques, and technologies that will add value to their production. This can be done through digital platforms. 
what has the AgriFOSI project done in Southeast Asia, particularly in the countries of Vietnam, Cambodia, and the Philippines, where the digitalization of extension services has been operating for the last 18 months? With this, the project aimed to explore the availability and quality of digital advisory information to smallholder farmers to ensure that their accessibility to science-based extension programs, innovative approaches, and timely market information is made available to them. It is a way forward to support food security in times of crisis. Different types of digitalization of extension services, or what we call it here, or the project DES, are providing timely and relevant information to smallholder farmers, offering them multiple benefits through more efficient agricultural production, improved market information, and increased income opportunities. The project, particularly in Cambodia, the Philippines, and Vietnam, have identified barriers and enablers to desk access and use by smallholder farmers in project communities to make the production system more effective and to improve farmers' incomes and food security. After an intervention, what key significant change has have taken place in our areas of uh, coverage. So far, we could say that farmers were facilitated to have access to and use of these desks in project areas and involved stakeholders in relevant research, such as training workshops on farming smartphone applications. We have oriented them on extension websites and programs and services developed by the government and the private sector. With this, they were introduced to effective agricultural information channels and market platforms that they were able to sell their farm produce, even during the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, farmers were introduced via project activities to more accurate and updated information about agriculture production technologies and market opportunities. Many farmers' groups have been established to learn, exchange, and support each other in applying the training on this we have provided for them. This paved the way to a strengthened collaboration and partnerships among agricultural stakeholders with the government, private sector, and the civil society sectors to ensure that there is a more productive an effective production system. Thank you for listening. <clears throat> thanks, thanks a lot, Floor Lees, and thank you for a very concise summary of your very interesting project. I now call on uh, Rashmat. So we're going from the Philippines now to Vietnam. Please, Rashmat, the, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you, Ivan. So good morning, good, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. So the, I think it is interesting that uh, the two projects in Southeast Asia, say Vietnam and Philippines, are interested in digital tools, I think. Because in Vietnam also, we actually focus on e-commerce of agricultural products. So um, as uh, all countries, I think, across the world, then Vietnam also was affected by COVID-19. Yeah, for example, at the, in all sectors, including in agricultural sector, for example, at national level, uh, it has been reported that uh, the export of Vietnam agricultural product has declined by about 30%. And then at community and then household level, actually many farmers experienced um, uh, uh, they were deprived of income because they could not sell the, the the products agricultural products because of the travel restriction and also social distancing for example in different levels applied by the government of uh, vietnam especially uh, along 2021 and until the mid of 2022 so then uh well this the challenge but also farmers had also had a challenge from the climate change 
Vietnam also is one of the most affected countries by climate change, like drought and also uh, flooding during the, the rainy season. So then learning from this impact of COVID-19 pandemic, then the government of Vietnam tries to boost the local participation in e-commerce. Why? Because uh, although we are now, for example, in many countries, we can say are back to normal, but then e-commerce has participation in e-commerce has several advantages. For example, now the first to diversify market channel, and then so farmers not to become too dependent on middlemen that come and buy the products directly at the farm gate. And then the second, actually, uh, the farmers can reach potential customers, not only within their region, but also other provinces, for example, to Hanoi as the capital of and also urban and consumer center in, in Vietnam. And then uh, e-commerce also has an advantage that uh, it can better involve women and youth, for example, to use the uh, social medias or e-commerce platforms to use a smartphone to, to for them to better participate or for uh, the families to better participate in e-commerce. What the project has uh, done so far, so then first uh, we aim actually to uh, investigate the knowledge, technical and policy level challenges for uh, to help uh, boost again um, local participation in uh, e-commerce, especially smallholder farmers and also actors along the supply and market value chain. And then we did policy review, uh, policies at national and sub-national level. And also we did some awareness generation and capacity development activities like training on e-commerce, on how to use e-commerce platforms, etc. And also we do uh, we produce communication materials such as videos and also policy brief. Uh, the changes so far that we observe uh, mainly uh, the, there is a strengthened effort and more coordinated effort at local level among stakeholders like uh, local authorities, the research institutions, the farmers cooperative, there are mass organizations in Vietnam like farmers union or women unions. So then they work together in more coordinated and strengthened way to help especially smallholder farmers to better participate in e-commerce. And then thanks to the enhanced knowledge, uh, uh, yes, uh, the smallholder farmers now have a more interest actually to engage in e-commerce and they can see the potential benefits of e-commerce especially again to diversify market channels that can help uh, stabilize uh, their income. I think that's uh, all from my side at, at the moment. Thank you. Th thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Rajmal, for illuminating the potential uh, benefits of, of uh, e-commerce with small-scale farming systems in Vietnam. Brilliant, thanks. Now, uh, at in, in the AgriForce program, we, we, we do have an excellent advisory board. And you heard from Stephen Mashuri in the, in, the, in the African session. And we now have two board members from, from Asia present with us. Uh, so I call first on Sian from Vietnam. The floor is yours, Sian. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Good afternoon from Hanoi, the capital of Vietnam to everyone. Uh, you have heard the two uh, speakers mentioned about the situation in Vietnam, especially during the COVID um, outbreak. And now with the limited time given today, I will say very briefly overview uh, a food crisis in Vietnam and some comment on the projects. Um, as you know that the population of Vietnam currently is about 100 million and in 2016 it reported that the amount of people facing hunger in Vietnam was 9.4 percent and it was decreasing years by year and in 2020 it was about 5.7 percent but uh, the COVID-19 outbreak 
and with the COVID lockdowns, increase a huge unemployment rate that have boost up to 5 million people into poverty, especially uh, the mainly holding skilled jobs in the informal sector. Uh, and even though we produce a lot of rice and we are mainly exporting rice and fruit, but not on uh, this as only available in uh, some remote area of the country. Uh, so in certain season, there is not offered enough uh, food for people in those areas. And uh, the fact that uh, in 2018, uh, the Prime Minister issues Zero Hunger National Action Plan aimed to fulfill the Sustainable Development Goal number two of the UN with five specific targets by 2030, uh, including ensuring food and nutrition for people year round, and no malnutrition uh, among children under two, uh, development of sustainable food system, and most small scale farmers enjoying increase in productivity and income and no uh, wastefulness uh, and loss of food. Um, and uh, you will see that in uh, the small scale farm in Vietnam, there are many weakness need to be improved. For example, productivity, quality, safety, or sustainable. And we also can see some uh, reason the farmers lack like information of knowledge on technology, service, or market and consumer as also very quick. And um, and I can see one project uh, of Agriforce carry out in Vietnam help uh, before uh, help um, small holder fruit farmer better engage in e-commerce. But I think it's very very important for the government to develop its plan on bringing agricultural production household to e-commerce uh, and as well as promoting the development of the digital economic um, economy in agriculture and rural area. Uh, however, I am thinking there are some difficulties even when the farmers can sell their food on the e-commerce, uh, for example, to ensure the product quality. As you know that uh, fruit are difficult to preserve uh, with a short shelf life and uh, also changing prices day by day and the preservation and transportation of uh, 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 this product is also much more difficult compared to other items. So um, I, I, I wish that the researchers should consider to add more research on that and also to add more uh, content relevant on this issue into the policy recommendation. And the other project uh, provided clearly evidences uh, that uh, the small holder would gain many benefits when they participate the, the training courses via digital extension services. And the training courses could bring a connection between the farmer and farmer, and also between the researcher and farmers, and farmers with local authority or uh, extension people. And, and I also think it's a very, very good reason to support the government's plan on digital transformation in agriculture. However, I am still considering that how to control the information in the digital system that is also very challenging. And I, I also with that, uh, um, the, the researchers should, uh, research, uh, should have a more comment uh, on that or have uh, some more investment and have uh, some recommendation in the, for the policy. Uh, and in, this, uh, and in, addition, uh, in addition that uh, I am thinking these two projects should be combined uh, in the future in some way, uh, for example, both e-commerce and digital extension services should be applied together uh, uh, by the small scale farmers in, in both projects and the policy you know, recommendation also should uh, cover both as well. Yeah, that, that's uh, my idea. Thank you very much. Th thanks a lot, Sian for those uh, thoughtful comments. Irish, I call upon you. We are a bit in a time constraint here. So I, I um, wish if you could keep your, your comments uh, for uh, th in within three minutes, I would be very, very grateful. So now we move from Vietnam to Irish, our second board, board member in the Philippines. Please, Irish. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, since I have, um, I have 
uh, three minutes. So just to say that uh, I'm here representing the Asian Farmers Association for Sustainable Rural Development, which has members in uh, Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Indonesia, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And um, I don't want to reiterate what has already been said by uh, our colleagues uh, also from um, the East uh, Africa uh, Farmers uh, uh, Federation. Uh, I, uh, I mean, we have a very, uh, we, we are experiencing a very uh, similar um, uh, situation with, with the ongoing multiple crises. Uh, and then uh, now we have uh, climate crisis. Uh, we have uh, the degradation of um, of our um, our land and and the water quality, and also of course the fuel price crisis, which has really uh, impacted our members. So we did have uh, some consultation in in the past years among our constituencies and membership, and also the wider civil society movement in um, in Southeast Asia. And I just wanted to to highlight some um, few things to respond to the first question on the food crisis and in general the multiple crises that uh, we are uh, we have experienced and are continue to be experiencing so indeed food insecurity was uh, expressed during the, the consultation there was a lack of safe uh, safe nets and social protection in place for the people who relied on daily wages the urban workers and the informal uh, workers and they were the one who uh, who were greatly affected and because of the uh, the restrictions um, and uh, yeah, restrictions in place uh, there is food waste in the rural area and at the same time there is lack of fresh and nutritious food in the urban areas and uh, people in the urban areas relying mostly in ultra processed food so i think um, the, the indeed the pandemic has um, has shown us uh, the the problem and challenges of the current uh, food system that we have and from the par farmers perspective um, i just want to highlight uh, three things that came out during the consultation that indeed there was uh, economic loss experience at various intensity for example the fuel price hike manifested manifested in increased cost of production post-harvesting, processing, and transportation costs. And fishers, uh, fisher folks are spending much more to have access to the same fishing areas that they have been fishing on. And on the production side, with the increased cost of agri-inputs, along with the increased price of food items, goods, and services, there was a tendency or, you know, farmers uh, reduce their investment, uh, especially uh, towards uh, crops that are dependent on um, chemical inputs. And this is affecting now the, the yield and the farm uh, outputs um, in, in general. And also I want to, to, to say that um, sociocultural practices in agriculture was dis disrupted by the pandemic. I think it was also mentioned earlier. And there were also cases of land grabbing, land use change and resource conflict in Southeast Asia. So uh, that is what I want to share on on the crisis. So I want to uh, to respond to um, to the project uh, that were uh, presented. Uh, digitalization, e-commerce. Yes, uh, we we acknowledge that it's a reality. It's happening. And um, in fact, during the pandemic, some of our members uh, at the national level or national farmers organization in Laos and in the Philippines, they have tried to uh, to to um, set up uh, e-commerce platforms and uh, it was uh, uh, very challenging and very uh, costly uh, for them. So I think uh, it's important uh, moving forward that uh, we, we look for business models uh, so that cooperatives and farmers organization that would set up e-commerce um, or uh, digital platforms for their value chain will be able to sustain you know the, the management of, of e-commerce it's it's very costly uh, one of our members in the philippines they have tried to you know to uh, look for uh, e-commerce platform available in the market and it's uh, it, it's uh, the cost is like 50 million you know a peso to actually buy the, the the software and manage the website so it's not feasible for farmers organization however they managed to do the low cost um, like models they hired a, an IT programmer and now they were able to launch their own e-commerce so I think it's important that um, you work with uh, cooperatives because they have the capacity to actually manage the e-commerce platform uh, and they are able to sustain another challenge when setting up e-commerce platform or digitalizing extension 
is, um, I mean, for e-commerce in particular, the problem that our member in Lao have uh, experienced, for example, is the profiling of its member. So it was mentioned uh, earlier that um, data uh, security is, is very important. Some farmers uh, are not willing to provide their uh, information like address, land size, number of crops, uh, you know, uh, uh, co uh, input requirements so those things uh, there are barriers but uh, there is also potential there are opportunities that we also see uh, for e-commerce and digitalization of extension services on the digitalization of extension services i think um yeah language is very important so some of our members they were they were able to uh, they were successful in doing um extension through digital because they have uh, translated the content into the local language. So, yes, uh, it's three minutes. So that's the um, insights I want to share. Thanks, Arish. And with this, I want to sort of thank all the members of the Asian panel with a clap. And uh, and um, thanks for interesting presentations and good reflections. And and we move into the Q&A session. Mm -hmm. I'll leave the word in Gamdum. Yes. Um, so we're going into our Q&A session. For those of you who are joining us online, feel free to put your question in the chat. For those of you who are joining us in the room physically, feel free to walk up and take the microphone and ask your question. So do we have any questions in the chat or anyone in the room with a question? A question? Yes. Please walk up to the table, uh, pick the microphone and ask the question. As we wait for anyone in the room or in the chat to ask a question, I have a question for one of the panelists and I'll direct it to either Fanith or Sen, who are part of the Digital Extension Services team. Um, and in AgriForce, we work with the theory of change model where we invite different stakeholders to work with the project teams to harness this knowledge that we have and research as knowledge as well. My question is, what are the barriers for you as a researcher to co-create this knowledge together with these stakeholders? I direct the question to either Fanit or Sen. Fanit? Or Sen? Oh, uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. So the question about how, uh, you know, this uh, agree for say provides a wider chance, not only building capacity for the researcher, but also a chance that we co-create with other stakeholders to to get the knowledge and share the knowledge. So like our project in the challenge three on the scientific base on the digitalization on the agriculture, this is a new topic for South Asian, even we are in the world of the digitalization, but the, the keyword digital extension service is very new for the stakeholder in, in Cambodia, Vietnam, and also in the Philippines. Uh, we just implement the project in the small scale but agree for say provide us a chance that we mobilize the stakeholder, come together, co-create the knowledge, share the knowledge, and then everyone just get something that new. Wow, this is a digital extension. Why we cannot work together to uh, to move or to help the smallholder farmers in another level? Because as you can see, many problems occur, many new problems. If we maintain the the farmer in the conventional technology or our knowledge is cannot work or cannot solve the problems. So this agree for say provide us a kind of the sharing. I think we've lost Fanny Sen. Anything to add? Yes. Uh, good afternoon from Vietnam. So uh, it is uh, an interesting question. Um, so digital extension services is a new concept for for us, even our uh, okay. uh, It is new to us, so we need time to um, study and also time to uh, transfer in our uh, local language and uh, in our uh, context to work with the stakeholders. So I think the theory of change is very, I think it is significant to us. It is the first Okay, we seem to be losing. Research project. Okay. Normally, the theory of change of life for a developing world, but it is. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. So I think um, for the new concept of extension service, we. Yeah. 
we need more time. So during uh, only uh, over 18 months, we we have to interact with different stakeholders and also um, uh, most of them they they, they are uh, not familiar with the digital extension services. So we, we need time to interact with them and to work with them about the, this new concept to make them understand and involve and engage them in the research. So I think the most barriers, the most challenging for us is the time constraint and also the, the new concept to make them understand. Thank you. Main barrier. Thank you for those answers. Um, we seem to be having some connection issues, but that's normal. But thank you, Fanith and Sen, for your questions. You can just pick the microphone and uh, speak to it. Just detach it, yeah. Oh, you need to remove it. Just remove it. It will come out, exactly. Thank you. So uh, I'm sorry. And introduce yourself and ask the question. Yeah, thank you. I'm Sara Graslund with uh, SLU Global. Thank you so much for these incredibly interesting presentations. Really very valuable for all of us to hear about these um, insights from the current navigating of, uh, of the food crisis uh, from all these different teams. Uh, and I have two, two questions relating to uh, uh, traditional crops that came up in several of the projects. Uh, and one is about uh, to what extent do you see that the uh, uh, policies and regulations, etc., for uh, the big crops, rice, maize, etc., uh, to what extent are those policies hurdles for uh, increased use of traditional crops. Uh, and the other question is more like on the overall agri level. Uh, here we have heard uh, like some common uh, themes emerge from several of the projects, for example, when it comes to the need to increase use of traditional crops. And uh, you spoke in the beginning, Sophia, about uh, trickling up and uh, have these um, uh, uh, themes or topics, have they emerged independently of each other or have you had a joint uh, theme from the beginning with the uh, yeah, particular topics that you've uh, promoted or is it a true trickling up? Thank you. I think the first question will direct it to David Jakinda. To what extent have policies or regulations been hurdles towards uh, achieving your project success? Thank you very much. Uh, if you allow me to rephrase the question, uh, I think the, the concern is that uh, uh, it appears that uh, most of uh, the government policies, food policies in our countries uh, focus on a few major commodities like maize, rice, wheat. And uh, now the issue is to what extent that, does that hamper the development or recognition of uh, indigenous foods? Uh, well, the answer to that is that uh, because of that overemphasis of policies and budgets on major cereal crops, particularly rice, maize, rice, and wheat, uh, when we experience global shocks uh, uh, to do with the exchange rates, uh, to do with oil products and other global issues, then it leaves these countries in a tight corner uh, uh, in the sense that they cannot easily adjust their local food policies because they've uh, fixed a huge amount of their budgets and planning on uh, importable commodities, the cereals. Yet, in the local household diets, there are indigenous foods, some of which are, uh, are short maturing, and, and they do not depend on global shocks. So I think uh, the solution here is to, is to, uh, is to pursue a multi-pronged approach that we, we can scale down on the level of emphasis on the major commodities without forgetting uh, 
the indigenous foods which take shorter periods and they fit within the food preferences of the local communities so that in case we experience global shocks uh, we do not uh, we, we have something uh, to fall back on and that's how we can build build local locally resilient food systems so we just need to have uh, a conversation on how to begin thinking towards uh, a healthy balance of, in our policy planning and budgeting so that we do not overemphasize on the on the major on the few major uh, cereal crops that that are affected by global shocks thank you okay maybe sophia you can answer the second question on the overall themes for agriculture did they emerge independently or how did we come about them yeah, thank you sorry it's a very good question uh, and the agri c program we consist of four different challenges we call them and those challenges they were identified by agri c alumni and also together with discussions with the advisory board members and other stakeholders and that's sort of the core of the program these four challenges each of them addressing a specific theme and within these challenges then we have these 18 projects and we've seen a few of them today and uh, we haven't been able to use like open calls within the agro c program because that's a process that we, we just couldn't handle it uh, uh, work-wise so we have used the existing networks we have uh, universities we have worked with before and also added new universities uh, as partners and all suggestions of these projects they have come from the project partners in our at the collaborating universities we have so it has not been like us coming up with this idea so it's they're very well grounded within the local context and within the universities and of course then develop together with us using this theory change approach thank you we have one last question in the chat uh, from madeleine and she asks um in this new setting of multiple stressors, do the project see it only as a hurdle or is this a window of opportunity to transform many of the business as usual of farming practices? And I want to pose this question to both Frank and Judith, if you could answer in 30 seconds each as we wrap this up. And, uh, Judith, are the hurdles that we're experiencing now, again, the multiple stressors, are they an opportunity or um, are they a hurdle? Frank? It is uh, an opportunity to... Is, can I go? Yes, Judith, please go ahead. Yes, the hurdles you are facing, some of them are natural, we can't do anything about them. So it is an opportunity for us to think beyond the hurdles and find a way strategies on how we can uh, sustainably have food security in, this, in our communities. So the hurdles we can't run away from the hurdles. The only way to to, to see them to see them as opportunities on how we can sustainably achieve uh, the objectives of our first twenty thirty. Thank you. Yes. Uh, would you want me to add on that? Yes, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Yes, I agree with Judith that uh, the stressors and hurdles that we are experiencing in one way present an opportunity. I mean, case in point is uh, 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 previously there was a Lazafar approach to uh, farming in the urban context. So if I talk about Tumbali and the uh, Kasesa where I'm, 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 I've been working with my team, uh, where the, re the, the, the whole thinking was uh, planning should be for physical space. There's no space for urban agriculture. But with all the stresses that we are having in the different stakeholders are coming in to realize that they cannot think the same way. All space that is available can and should be able to support food provision and uh, support the food shed. So the stressors are helping stakeholders to think out of the box, to see them as opportunities through which uh, uh, production can be enhanced uh, in, in this context that we are dealing with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that's it for the Q&A session. Very good questions with very good responses. Now I want to hand over to Mats Obari, uh, Senior Policy Specialist at CEDA, to give their closing remarks. Welcome, uh, Mats. Wow, thanks a lot. This has been a very intense and interesting session, or sessions, 10 of them in only 40 minutes. 
So I had my doubts when coming and would this be feasible? But yes, it has been feasible and it has been so interesting. And uh, so it's a big, it's a huge privilege for me to deliver this closure, which in part already has been done. We have heard from Stephen on the Africa context, and we heard from Sian and Irish from the with the Asian focus. Uh, but still, some rounding up words here to get these first-hand experiences on how the different crises, the different reasons for the food crisis have concretely been affecting the food systems and their livelihoods in Africa in Southeast Asia has been very good. And um, also then to understand and to get, to get this leveraging of local knowledge through the, the research and how that could in the short and in the longer run be boosting the situation for the smallholder farmers when it comes to resilience, when it comes to reducing poverty and uh, etc cetera, etc. Cetera. And also the importance of creating good partnership is something that has been coming through in uh, in these in the document and in the presentations and then also that this one size doesn't fit all some talk about one country one commodity but here we have so clearly understood that this is not the situation you can't i mean you, we can't talk about the african situation we can't talk about the ugandan situation it's so diversified we need to go down to the micro level to see on on individual districts on livelihood level to see which crops which commodities which markets etc cetera, etc cetera, that are fit for purpose to be a way forward on um, uh, for the livelihoods there and um, I think on these in the in the report here on the way that, that's talked about the ways forward some of these um, observations there are some of them are well well known for us since before but they need to be mentioned and stressed once again all over and over again until we find good solutions to them uh, and what i will be curious of is understanding more not only the what's but also the how's we have had some house, we have heard about the um, the e-commerce and the, the um, um, e-extension services, which is definitely a huge need. And there we have seen good concrete examples, but we have also seen these very important observation on the what. So I think this is would be an interesting follow up on from this um, uh, from this project um, then also as was raised in the question these the common denominator there are things coming through from the various geographical contexts and then to distill that even further what's common de denominator and what's also the more newer observations the more innovative thoughts that could be then launched in other uh, in connections with other for us then on the house i mean it has been the the launch of more efficient better cooperative solutions was mentioned i think in both on two of the uganda uh, um, pieces and in vietnam and there how do we get through there the um, the cooperatives hasn't had in many in many places the best reputation for various reasons 
But in a country like Sweden, we had in the 19th century the development of the, farm, the producers' cooperatives, which still serves its purpose <clears throat> for the Swedish farmers and for farmers in many other countries how to weigh to find good ways forward uh, i mentioned the digitalization the e-extension services and yes extension services in many countries are lagging financing are lagging resources and also we have got the um, uh, the providers of input that come with their their um, their uh, advice, but of course that's colored by the produce they are selling. So then, how to get this? I think this is a very interesting idea to follow. But of course, you need to have the infrastructure in place. The uh, the farmers need to have access to the internet. Need to have the local infrastructure and i think reports like like this will be useful we have got we had in 2021 we had the uh, food system summit that will be a stock take, stock taking event this july and there we need evidence on what works and what uh, could I mean, what, what could assist the ways forward uh, then I was um, in the initially, yes, if I were to decide, if I, only I were to decide, of course, I, I would advocate for the agriforce to continue and build on the existing uh, very good, interesting ways of working. But of course, as you all know, we the resources are scarce also within the Swedish ODA, and there are very many needs to be met, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, but I'll follow the uh, the second part of this second phase, and hopefully something could be done. And definitely, men very many good things have already been done through this project. So with this, thank you to all the presenters and all the others that have been involved in the country examples and to all, all of you that has organized this event in such a very nice way. Thanks a lot. It's a hand of applause. So as we wrap up, we'd like to take a moment to thank everyone who was involved in the event, uh, the project members who took their time to write their submissions, the program team who guided in the editing and the writing of the report, and for the partners for their tireless efforts in producing this report. We also want to express uh, gratitude to all of you who made it online and in real life to attend this event. Thank you for joining us and for your continued interest and engagement in addressing the global food crisis. Thank you, Black Box, for the seamless production and the work that you've done. Thank you very much. So everyone is welcome for lunch and networking and thank you very much. The report is online. You can contact any of the challenge um, members, even Sophia and the advisory board members. The contacts are there. Remember the report and any other information on the AgriForce program is available on slu.se forward slash AgriForce. Thank you and have a good day. <laughs>